This is the first ever conversation that's been had globally on survivorship and mesothelioma. Uh, I think it is so exciting. I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing our meso warriors who have survived, who are doing well. And we have Dr. Garg. Dr. Garg um, originally started working on survivorship at MD Anderson. He's now faculty at Johns Hopkins and has an active practice at the Anne Arundel Medical Center in, uh, um, in Annapolis, Maryland. Dr. Garg, thank you so much for being with us. And how do I put that to the slide? Uh, here. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thanks for, for having me. I, it might take a moment to get the slides in place. I, I just wanted to say when I finished or completed my fellowship at MD Anderson in Houston, uh, that was a great experience, but one of the great experiences about it was we saw lots of mesothelioma. And as a trainee, you know, I was really struck at the dismal prognosis that was quoted about mesothelioma, and it was very humbling, you know, at, when I was learning about it. So I wanted to congratulate everyone in this room and everyone who's battling it. I wish you the, the very best. So my slides are still pending right now. Oh wait, there you go. Um, so I just wanted to say that there's not a lot of published literature right now about survivorship and mesothelioma. With all the brilliant research uh, being taken place, much of which we heard earlier today, uh, we hope that number continues to increase. But I will say I was going to use breast cancer and some of the other cancers as a model uh, regarding survivorship issues that you may endure or you may uh, have to deal with. So regarding uh, mesothelioma, I just some bread and butter basics, if I could, please. It's a tumor of cirrhosal surfaces of the pleura peritoneum. Those are some of the most common sites. And it's not that common of a cancer. As an example, there's 5,000 anal cancers, there's 5,000 chronic myeloid leukemias, and those are considered kind of rare cancers, if you will. Uh, this tumor is even more rare, and there's only 3,300 cases, of which there's only several hundred peritoneal cases involved. Therefore, we're really lacking in published literature on how to direct our patients going forward when it comes to survivorship issues. So I'm, I'm not saying this is the entire treatment paradigm for pleural mesothelioma. Sometimes it's institution specific, but some of the modalities that you might go through with this type of tumor is surgery. Uh, many of you may have read about or had performed a radical extrapillal pneumonectomy, which is a pretty rigorous surgery. Uh, oftentimes we'll do radiation, and that can have its attendant side effects, which we can talk about in a moment. And I, I'm a medical oncologist, so I give chemotherapy, and I've given chemotherapy before to mesothelioma. Uh, cisplatin and uh, pemetrexid are two of the very common agents that we sometimes give. For peritoneal mesothelioma, more mesothelioma of the abdomen, uh, it's a little bit of a different treatment, but same type of cocktail, if you will, same type of chemotherapy drugs. Uh, Dr. Sugarbaker has really pioneered the surgery uh, debulking, a uh, high pack, which some of you may have endured and or heard about. Uh, and also sometimes we even do radiation to the abdomen. Now in terms of late effects, near the latter part of this talk, I'll kind of talk about different things that as a patient and as a provider, whether it be an MD or nurse practitioner, that perhaps we can work you know, with our patients to hopefully help uh, get through these side effects with more rigor. But some of the late side effects that we've seen, whether it be pleural or peritoneal mesothelioma, uh, is abdominal symptoms. We've had many patients indoors having increased abdominal girth, nausea, weight loss, which can really affect you know, the quality of life and the vitality and energy of a patient. Uh, because let's say if you've had surgery to the abdomen, uh, you, we see obstructions, whether it be from adhesions, hernias, things of that sort. Uh, shortness of breath, you know, oftentimes not just pleural fluid, you can get that from radiation, but sometimes pneumonitis, where you can get inflammation of the lung. And we've had patients, I had patients, not from mesothelioma per se, but for lung cancer, who had radiation, and they had a chronic cough for eight months on end that really caused a compromise of the quality of life. Uh, sometimes myelodysplastic syndrome, I, maybe many of you read about Robin Roberts, who I think is a pretty amazing woman, but we think subsequent to her chemotherapy for breast cancer, which is different from these type of, the cancers are, the, the chemotherapy drugs are different, but myelodysplastic syndrome, it's not very prevalent, but cisplatin, one of the drugs that we do give oftentimes for mesothelioma, five or seven years after 
uh, receiving it, you can form myelodysplastic syndrome, which is basically a dysmorphic bone marrow disorder, which can sometimes evolve into leukemia. It's not very common, one out of two to 300, but it is something five or seven years after receiving it, you know, touch wood, as we have more and more patients reaching that benchmark, something to keep in mind. We see muscle weakness, fatigue, chronic pain, and a chemotherapy brain. I, I know uh, my mom's an ovarian cancer patient, and after her uh, chemotherapy, she said that I'm not quite the same. I, I can't think clearly, and I'll talk more about that uh, in the latter part of the talk. So what is a cancer a survivor? So an individual is considered a cancer survivor from the time of cancer diagnosis and treatment to the balance of his or her life. So ground zero, based off a formal uh, definition, is really when you're diagnosed with a tumor. Uh, what I think is really cool, uh, and being the son of a cancer patient, is that this definition now includes those afflicted with the cancer, but also the loved ones and the caregivers, and it takes a team effort. I know cancer really does affect not only the individual patient, but loved ones, friends, and, and I'm glad the NCI incorporated that as part of the definition of a cancer survivor. Regarding our three stages of survivorship, living with cancer begins at diagnosis, and this includes things like chemotherapy, debulking surgery, perhaps radiation. Uh, living through cancer, uh, this is a period following treatment and in many ways, this is the most anxiety-provoking time for a patient because, you know, oftentimes when you've run the gamut of treatment, whether it be surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, it can be very nerve-wracking that if I'm not getting better, the cancer is going to come back. If I'm not receiving treatment, you know, how do I know the cancer is not going to creep up and get me? Uh, so that's actually part of the survivorship as a medical oncologist, understandably so in many regards, that I think patients are the most scared. Living beyond cancer is, is long-term survivorship, and some of the psychosomatic uh, and organic complications that you might have endured because of the treatment. So number of cancer survivors is increasing. I don't know if this slide's projecting well, but I think this is very amazing. There's over 12 million survivors. I recently published, it's up to 13.4 or 13.5 million uh, folks in the United States are cancer survivors, which is an amazing number. And as a, as a general medical oncologist, in our literature, even preeminent journals, we're reading more and more about survivorship, not so much with mesothelioma quite yet, but breast cancer, colon cancer, and I think that's really cool. I think it's a credit goes to a lot of scientists who've pioneered a lot of great findings, and also to patients, many of whom were brave enough to enroll in clinical trials, which have really advanced the field. So about 67% of adults diagnosed with cancer today will be alive in five years. This is for all cancer, uh, mind you. And over 20 million U.S. survivors will be expect, cancer survivors will be expected by 2020. So I think going forward, we're going to see a lot more published about cancer survivorship. Regarding estimated number of persons alive in the United States as of 2007, you know, most patients who are survivors are over 65 years of age. And, you know, oftentimes as we age, um, it, it takes a little bit harder time to recover from different things, whether it be fatigue and shortness of breath. Uh, but even our younger cohort, 20 to 39, we're seeing more and more patients afflicted uh, with cancer. Now, in terms of the type of cancers, you know, breast cancer and prostate cancer, if you look at the pie chart, are the most common. And, and because of that, most of the survivorship literature is culled from breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer. If you look at the chart, you know, lung cancer is about 3%, which isn't a huge number. And if you pare it down even more, a lot of lung cancer is small cell, non-small cell. You know, pleural mesothelioma is a lung cancer. Um, so there's not much written about lung cancer survivorship, let alone mesothelioma yet. But I hope uh, there will be going forward. So this is kind of a triad uh, of three different things. When we talk about survivorship with many of our patients in our, in our cancer center, we kind of take a three-pronged approach. You know, as a medical oncologist, when I was at MD Anderson, I was so focused on learning the clinical trials, the chemotherapy, because that was going to be my role. You know, I was going to be the person who gave the chemotherapy. But a lot of these things are issues that come up with many of our patients. And, and I think that we're becoming more privy and aware of them. Like, so physical, after treatment, we have many patients who come into clinic, you know, with fertility issues, fatigue, sexual dysfunction, a lot of it can be from, you know, chemotherapy too, and that can 
cause a huge ramifications for the personal life of a patient. You know, psychologic, you know, we have many patients who endorse when they, you know, come into our clinics. They're just so consumed with fear that how do I know the cancer hasn't come back? How do you know for sure? Is there a blood test that you have that can tell me with 100% certainty? Uh, and it can be very difficult for them, even if they have a successful CAT scan result, uh, to really move forward with her life. Uh, and and that, I can really respect that. You know, socially too, uh, we've had a lot of patients who tragically lost their job and they were the only source of income for their family and, and even their children. You know, many would just break down in clinics sometimes that I have a seven-year-old, I, 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 I'm the only one there for them. I lost my spouse many years ago. It's a very scary time. So part of the concept of survivorship is to really address all these issues that sometimes as a medical oncologist, we don't always get a chance to or time to. Um, and we have nurse practitioners now in our survivorship uh, clinic for breast cancer who really do focus on these issues, which I think is fantastic. So uh, the LiveStrong is an, a pretty amazing organization. And the next three slides I just want to spend a little bit of time about. But if you look at the darker blue line, these are concerns endorsed by a patient. So if you look at physical concern, let's say neuropathy, that tingling sensation that sometimes cisplatin can cause, most of it goes away, but five or 10% of the time it can be more long term. But if you look at neuropathy, 40% had it, but only 40% or 60% didn't even ask about it or seek help for it. Uh, so this is an unmet need, you know, where patients may have lots of issues that may seem nuanced or subtle, but are really important. And so this, these are things that we have to be more aware of as a caregiver team. Emotional concerns, um, two of the lines didn't show up, I apologize. But let's say for family member risk. So 50% had a concern that, will one of my loved ones be going through the same process as me? Will they be predisposed to having this cancer or not? Uh, will my son or daughter or my spouse have uh, mesothelioma like I did? And only a lot of them had this, but most did not seek help. Another unmet need. And practical concerns, and you know, especially we live in a very tough time economically, being from Michigan, um, it's, it seems like all my friends that I grew up with, many of whom lost their jobs, but a lot of people do have employment issues. I, I've had patients who are sharp as a whip, um, who after going through chemotherapy, running the gamut of treatment, they didn't really have, a lot of them didn't feel as sharp, even on job interviews, and a lot of them tragically lost their jobs. It can be very difficult. So basically, to put a summation to the previous couple slides, not all needs are being addressed. And this was one article that was published in 2009, just to be evidence you know, based about it. And a lot of patients feel that after going through cancer treatment that, you know, I have a lot of unmet needs. You know, after going through all these things, I, I have altered body image. A lot of our breast cancer patients feel that way. Um, weight gain and a lot of stress in the family, you know, relationships, finances. And a lot of these things are not being addressed necessarily by the caregiving team. So one thing as oncologists, I think this is being promulgated more and more, is that it really takes a team effort, not just as a medical oncologist, but primary care doctors. And so uh, one thing that at Anne Arundel and all over the country we're starting to do is to let primary care doctors know, uh, you know what type of surgeries you've gone through what type of chemotherapy drugs you received, and what are the attendant side effects short and long term that you may incur. Same with radiation. And also in our survivorship clinic, and this is not unique to ours, but all over the country again, is that surveillance strategy, who's gonna order my CAT scan for surveillance? Is a surgeon, is a medical oncologist, is a radiation oncologist? I had one patient uh, laugh that, you know, one time she had three requisitions for a CAT scan, because every medical oncologist taking part in her care had written a requisition for it. And it seems kind of you know, redundant to some degree. And, and I think this patient had a feeling that, are they not communicating with each other? Or is my radiation doctor, chemotherapy doctor, primary doctor? You know, so sometimes as a survivor, we want to have a team approach and make a patient feel that everyone's talking to each other. So this didn't project uh, very well, uh, but Sloan Kettering, uh, this was just as an example of a survivorship plan that we're starting to give patients. And if you can't read it because the, the writing's kind of muddled, 
it just talks about you know the surgery, the type of surgery. This was a breast cancer patient. When they had it, what type of surgery it was? Was it a lumpectomy, mastectomy, or you know what have you? What type of chemotherapy they received, and what type of radiation they received? And the reason why that's important, just as an example, let's say seven years after receiving cisplatin, if you were to be anemic, new onset anemia, and no other intercurrent reason to be anemic. That, and if the caregiver, even the primary care is aware that I receive cisplatin and that can cause that myelodysplastic bone marrow disorder, they might be more aware of that as an underlying condition that you might have. So the Commission on Cancer of the American College of Surgeons, uh, just to put a one-liner to this, by 2015, they really want um, the caregiving team to have a compendium, you know, one to two or three pages of a care plan, you know, what type of treatments the cancer patient received, uh, what doses, and I think that's great because this helps the patient be their own advocate too and make sure nothing's missed. Now, surveillance for mesothelioma, uh, per the NCCN guidelines, which are guidelines that are compiled by some of the foremost experts in mesothelioma, if you look, and this is available online for anyone, but if you look at, look at the guidelines, they recommend a, a surveillance CAT scan after finishing treatment every six or 12 months for about two years and then annually thereafter, and of course, smoking cessation, if smoking. So one question that we get asked a lot, and at University of Chicago we did, at MD Anderson we, do, we did a lot, is that do CAT scans in and of themselves cause cancer? And if I'm a CNN junkie, I always watch that with my wife in the morning, and you know, one, I even think many months ago there was kind of an expose on you know, radiation exposure. So. What is true is that in, in the medical field, you'll always find a point and counterpoint. You know, sometimes if you look hard enough, you'll find something to support one side of the argument, if you will. So I, I concede the point that there are some studies preliminarily that might say too much radiation is bad, whether it be mammograms, CAT scans, what have you. However, uh, there was a, a very uh, well-conducted study published in 2011 in Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is a very reputable journal. And it was testicular cancer, which if you've ever had a loved one or a friend, uh, part of the surveillance paradigm, these patients get very, very frequent CAT scans because if you catch an early recurrence for testicular cancer, it's very salvageable, treatable. So this study of over 2,500 patients with testicular cancer underwent CAT scans for surveillance, and they were observed for 11 years. So that's a pretty good long-term follow-up, you know I'm just saying. Uh, so during the first five years, they underwent a median of 10 CAT scans of the abdomen and pelvis. So that's a lot of exposure, and this is with iodine contrast. Only 14 patients out of 2,500 were found to have secondary cancers in the abdomen and pelvis. Now, that number, you could make an argument, well, there's 14, but that wasn't statistically significant, so that could have been just quote-unquote bad luck. So this study uh, did say that getting surveillance CAT scans really is not felt uh, to lead to more secondary cancers. So I, I do agree you shouldn't do them every three months or every uh, you know, six weeks. Don't go overboard. Uh, but I just wanted to mitigate some concerns that some may have uh, with that. So why cancer uh, survivorship is important. Uh, so one in every 25 Americans is a cancer survivor. There's long-term medical and psychosocial uh, side effects, and oftentimes, you know, there's a lot of other secondary problems that happen. Sometimes chemotherapy or radiation can lead to other uh, problems besides cancer. You know, heart disease is still the number one killer that we have uh, in the United States. So, you know, in not this is not for prostate cancer, this talk, but prostate cancer patients, when we give Lupron, an anti-testosterone agent, there are some studies, one out of Canada, that can sometimes lead to maybe increased heart disease. So there's many things about cancer survivorship that are important in addition to just the cancer, there's other health conditions that can come up. So I'm, I'm gonna skip this slide if that's okay. So nutrition matters. So we get asked a lot about exercise and nutrition, and I think the reason why that's really cool is that this is something that a patient can be their own advocate about, and when you're done with your radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, uh, again, you know, we talked about that anxiety-provoking time. When you're done with treatment, it can be very fraught with uh, anxiety because, you know, I'm not having anything done. I'm not getting any treatments right now. Will the cancer come back? 
And nutrition does matter. I, I can't specifically say I, I looked uh, for mesothelioma in nutrition, so this is more generic advice that I think one could extrapolate to most, if not every cancer, including mesothelioma. But you know, weight gain is a frequent complication of treatment. Sometimes we see hormonal changes, which can contribute to that. You know, sometimes we see early satiety uh, after having a debulking surgery, let's say high pack, well, debulking with high pack for the abdominal peritoneal mesothelioma, as an example. Uh, you know, we've had patients, I haven't seen too many, but I had a couple at MD Anderson that I saw as a fellow, where anytime they would take a bite of food, they would get full so quickly, and they would say, how can I get my adequate nutrition? I, get, I feel so full. That's what early satiety means. And oftentimes, the reason why it's important is that there are some studies for different types of cancer, uh, foremost amongst them ovarian, prostate, and breast cancer, that if you increase your vegetable and fruit intake, you can help reduce your risk of cancer coming back. So these are just more confirmatory studies that exercise and diet uh, do matter. Um, in nutrition and survivorship, we see a lot of breast cancer, and uh, there was a study. Uh, these are not randomized studies. It's very hard to do randomized control studies with diet and nutrition. They're more observational, but there are hundreds of thousands of patients on some of these studies. And for breast cancer survivors, the more they ate fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, there was a reduced mortality. So I think we can segue that and parlay that into mesothelioma. For colon cancer, uh, there's over a study of over 1,000 survivors that a diet that had a higher intake of red meat, sugary desserts, increased the risk of cancer recurrence. And again, not necessarily on, on par with mesothelioma, but perhaps a, we can extrapolate this to mesothelioma. Uh, regarding uh, prostate cancer, you know, higher saturated fat uh, intake predicted a shorter disease-specific survival. So, you know, nutrition does matter. Now, supplements, I, um, I would say that the vast majority of patients I've seen for every tumor under the sun take some type of supplements. And in fact, there was a study in, in 2002, again, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, that up to 80% of cancer survivors uh, take some type of supplement. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, I, I, I've asked a lot of patients about it, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a vegetarian, so my wife and I are really into like supplements and things of that nature. But one thing when I try to take more of an evidence-based evidence approach with this, I try to find what's fact versus fiction. And a lot of my cancer patients would come in with literature to corroborate that. You know, I read about if I take you know, omega-3, if, if I took this vitamin, if I took selenium, it can help me. And not to debunk any of that, please, but you have to be careful. And, and the reason being is for prostate cancer, there was a study published in JAMA in 2011, very reputable journal, as you guys may well know, and it looked at consumption of selenium and vitamin E as a preventive measure to help ward off or prevent the prostate cancer. And patients who were taking selenium actually had an increased risk of prostate cancer in that study. And I think that's amazing. I mean, that's a natural substance, you know, and so you, we have to be careful. So what I always tell all my patients is that I, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't sit on the bully pulpit and say that you can't do this, you can't do that. And I respect taking supplements in terms of, you, you never know, but just be careful and do things in moderation. I, I would not go overboard with any supplement. An example that I would give you, for breast cancer, we sometimes recommend 600 units of vitamin D, and that's somewhat evidence-based, but we've had patients consume five or 10,000 units of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D helps with the absorption of calcium, and, and a couple months ago, maybe two months ago, there was a report that too much calcium, maybe vitamin D supplementation can increase your risk of, of heart attacks or, or coronary arteriosclerosis. So you, I, I would say that I, I would exercise caution, and I would be forthright with your caregiver team that, you know what, I'm taking this supplement. It, it would be good to make them aware of it. So omega-3 fatty acids, so I, I try to look to see if I could find any correlation with consumption of omega-3 that seems very popular and the reduced risk of cancer recurrence, and I couldn't. However, uh, it's felt that omega-3 can help ward off cardiovascular disease. So if you're a cancer patient, let's say mesothelioma, three or four years removed, and no evidence of recurrence, you know, heart disease, I think it'd be a shame if, if God forbid, that patient were to develop heart disease. So omega-3 
is something that I'm, I, I think might be a good idea, but it wouldn't be so much for cancer prevention as it would be to optimize your heart health. So to put things into conclusion for supplements, so I would say that right now, and this could change, because uh, you know, a lot of research is taking place. I know at MD Anderson, they're looking at curcumin for pancreatic cancer, different things like that. But evidence from some studies, uh, it doesn't appear that supplements necessarily will improve the prognosis or survival of all cancers. Uh, vitamin D, if it's okay, I'll, I'll skip. This is a little bit more germane for uh, breast cancer population. So alcohol and cancer survivors, we get asked this a lot. Uh, you know, people, everyone likes to drink maybe once in a while. And so what I would say is, is that I, I think that it's, it's safe. I, I don't think, you know, once in a while it's fine. There was a study looking at breast cancer where if you consumed more than three or four alcoholic beverages every week, uh, that could cause some bad effects. There's nothing on mesothelioma with alcohol. But what I would say is, is that Using that as a template, what I counsel my patients, every type of cancer patient, is that just use it in moderation, maybe once or twice a week, and, and don't do anything heavy. So regarding overall recommendations for food, nutrition, so I would recommend an adequate uh, protein intake, you know, fish, lean meat, uh, eggs, dairy, uh, nuts, tofu. If you're a vegetarian like me, I eat lots of tofu. Uh, increased fiber intake. The reason why I recommend this is uh, my mom actually had a, a lot of problems with constipation after her ovarian cancer debulking surgery. And for some patients with peritoneal mesothelioma, you may be having to battle that. So I think that you know fiber intake can help, help keep your stools regular. Constipation is very uncomfortable, especially if you have some residual uh, adhesions, if you will. It can really exacerbate that. So keeping yourself regular with stools can really help. Uh, low amounts of saturated fat, I, I think, makes sense uh, based off published literature to help reduce the risk of cancer coming back and also just for your overall health. Uh, high carbohydrates, I, I do recommend for all my patients two to three cups of vegetables and fruits every day. And one question we get asked a lot is sugar feeding tumor. If I eat too much sugar, we'll have an increased risk of cancer coming back. And I think it's an interesting discussion, and pathophysiologically, I can understand why, because we think of cancer as a Pac-Man that's voracious and it's consuming and it needs sugar to grow, but there's really no definitive evidence that that's the case in terms of diet. So what I would say is, I wouldn't go out of my way to not consume sugar, but I would use moderate doses. Uh, regarding other recommendations, smaller, more frequent meals, I think, helps. You know, oftentimes we've had patients after debulking surgeries in the abdomen where they, if they eat too much at once, they can get very uncomfortable. And, and, and then, you know, part of it, the issue is a lot of them feel, like is my cancer coming back? And this is how I presented. So I would say eating smaller, more frequent meals is the way to go. I'm a big fan of keeping hydrated. I, I think that even when I used to do internal medicine back at Johns Hopkins before I became a, a cancer a doctor, uh, I think dehydration is a big issue, especially in the summertime and the heat. So I'm a big fan of drinking water, but if you do it in between meals, you can kind of get the nutrition from your food and you can get the hydration in between. That's kind of a game plan that I, I think sometimes helps. Uh, if, you're, if you're having trouble eating, whether it's nausea, vomiting, that's chronic in nature, whether it's subtle abdominal pain from eating, uh, whatever you eat, you wanna make it count. Uh, so I'm a big fan of these protein shakes sometimes. Um, just because, if nothing else, if you can get 40 to 50 grams of protein a day, that can keep your energy up. Uh, referral to see a registered dietitian, I, I think they, the dietitians do a great job, and in many ways they're more well-versed than I ever could be about food. Uh, so sometimes if I have a patient who's endorsed having, let's say, a 20 or 30 pound weight loss uh, post-treatment, and they're not gaining any weight six months to a year afterward, I'll send them to a, nutrition, a nutritionist, and I think they do a really great job. So importance of physical activity, uh, I'll talk about the American Cancer Society recommendations. Uh, I think they do a great job uh, putting things together. Uh, but I, I think physical activity really helps. Uh, there's published literature that activity, 150 minutes of moderate activity every week is what the American Cancer Society has published as being kind of a template. And that includes chores, gardening, walking briskly. That counts, you know. And there's been some studies for you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, that we can hopefully reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. 
by just physical activity, I think that's amazing. You know, that, that's something that we all can do. Uh, it doesn't have to be running a marathon or anything like that. I, again, gardening, going for a walk with your loved one, maybe a dog, a pet, walking in museums, I think all those things help. And the other thing that I'll, I will say about physical activity is that you know, it can help your heart. And sometimes the heart, you can get a lot of collateral damage. Not always. In cisplatin and pemetrexid, truth be told, it doesn't have the same cardiac risk factors as adromycin would for breast cancer. I can see that point. But you know, if you're a cancer survivor, you, there can be other medical issues that you can have going forward. So exercise can help optimize your heart. Uh, maybe help thwart diabetes from forming. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that. And the other thing that a lot of our patients come in with is fatigue. And we'll send, I'm also a hematologist, so we'll send for the red cells, and it's 13.5, which is pretty good, or a hematocrit of 40. We'll send for a thyroid, it's normal. We'll ask them that, are you eating okay? And they're like, yeah, I eat a lot. You know, some say I eat like a horse. <laughs> and, and we can't figure out what's causing fatigue. And one thing that's been published is cancer fatigue, even post-treatment. Doesn't mean you have active cancer. It's something that people are publishing ab it about. We don't know if it's metabolism issues, hormonal, what have you. We don't know how it's mediated physiologically. But exercise has been shown to help reduce fatigue. And, and I would say that fatigue is one of the top five chronic side effects I've certainly seen as a medical oncologist. So uh, lung cancer, uh, th now this didn't really include mesothelioma in good faith, but still, I, I thought it was somewhat important for this audience, is that uh, there was a study published in uh, 2011 that it was a review of 16 studies, and it looked at over 600 lung cancer patients, and it showed that exercise both before and after surgery uh, really helped patients with uh, their fatigue went down, their energy level increased, and their mood increased too all of which I think are very important. <clears throat> so overall recommendations I have for, we talked about nutrition overall for exercise. I think exercise can increase energy. Uh, we, we've seen studies where it can help stimulate the appetite, increase your quality of life, greater sense of well-being, maybe by releasing endorphins. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I think that you know, emotionally, we talked about it, and I'll talk about it uh, in, the, in the latter part of the slides, but. You know, we see a lot of patients who have the dual issue of energy fatigue and also mental fatigue. It's a heck of a lot to go through with any type of cancer, emotionally and physically. So I, I'm a fan of yoga and tai chi. I, I think some of these mind-body type things, I call it two for one, I think they're very good. And it, I'm not saying it's right for everybody, but it's something that you might want to explore, perhaps. So we talked about moderate activities. So American Cancer Society, Again, it kind of talked about the things we talked about. You know, if, you have, if you're a little bit overweight, um, limit high calorie foods, increase physical activity, diet should be rich in vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Uh, regular physical activity, and that 150 minutes a week, I think that's just a good template to follow. If, if you do any activities better than no activity, but I think that's a good number that's been published and somewhat vetted out. Uh, so just a couple specific side effects. We've already touched upon a couple of these, uh, but fatigue, uh, some consider it to be the most common side effect of cancer treatment. We've had many patients say that, you know, I'm so glad that my, my cancer is gone, but I, I don't have any energy. I'm not, I'm not the same person I was two years ago, you know, before all this happened. And oftentimes, even sleep, we've had patients sleep 12 hours a day and they don't feel restored. Uh, and it can affect relationships and what have you. Now, it can be multifactorial, you know, dehydration, hormonal levels, anemia, and all these things should be checked. And I think that, I don't want to say that there couldn't be an organic reason. Oftentimes it is because of long-term anemia or something of, of that nature. But it, it's very multifactorial. Now, I'm not saying the, this advice, oh, and also, I'm sorry, medications. We have, a, we have a lot of patients on morphine, oxycodone, for chronic pain after surgery, radiation, maybe chemotherapy. And those can make patients very tired also. So it's, it's really, when I have patients come in with fatigue, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. It's very difficult to know exactly what's contributing or what's the main etiology for that. So my general advice, besides seeing your physician, whether primary care doctor, or oncologist, is try to keep hydrated, eat protein, quote unquote, try to eliminate nutritional issues. Uh, try to have a regular sleep schedule if you can. 
Uh, do activities you like. I'm a big fan, even if it's rainy outside, like my wife's an intern in training right now, uh, and even if she's feeling a little bit under the gun, you know, we'll go for walks in a museum. The Smithsonian is unbelievable, or even a mall. You know, if it's raining or cold outside, and if it's nice outside at nighttime, going for a walk, I think can improve the energy level and avoid stress. I think all of us, including physicians, can do a better job of that, but I think that can contribute to, to fatigue. Uh, memory problems, you know, I, I think this is a, a legit thing because there was a study that came out looking at MRIs post-chemotherapy for cancer patients, and there were some um, anatomical changes to some degree uh, to the brain after treatment. So I, when you hear the term chemo brain, I don't think that's hogwash. I, I think there is going to be more literature published about it. And we have a lot of patients who say that, you know, I have brain fog. I'm not as sharp as I once was. I used to be the number one employee uh, in my, my work, and now my boss even says, what's going on? You're not, you're not the same. And that can be due to different things, too. Sometimes chemotherapy, maybe sometimes different medications, unbeknownst to you or unbeknownst to us as a caregiver team. So some advice I give my patients is that, you know, write things down. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, uh, my mom did that, you know, after her treatment when she had trouble remembering things. And I, and I think it's just kind of, it kind of gives you a template to work with. Uh, repeat things in the mind. I, as when I was in training, I did the same thing too. You know, just repetition can really help. Uh, and we've had patients who've gone to work before and said, I've forgotten the names of colleagues, and it's so embarrassing. I've worked with them for 10 years. And what I've told them is that, you know, sometimes before going to work, kind of write some names down. You know, it, it, that way it'll be more at the tip of your tongue. It, it may, this is more of a temporizing measure, but it may help uh, shepherd you through the process of battling these memory problems. And crossword puzzles, doing things to keep your mind active, I think do help. Uh, pain, I think pain is a really um, important topic, and a lot of it can be multifactorial again. It can be organic from adhesions. It can be from neuropathy, whether that's from radiation, cisplatin, chemotherapy. And it's, it's really different etiologies, and there's different types of pain. Uh, so some advice that I have is that I think that physical therapy can really help. Uh, MD Anderson was really into acupuncture, and not for everyone, but I've had lots of patients who their neuropathy and pain got a lot better with it. And I think it's attractive in the sense that you don't have to take a pill or anything like that. I think that's neat. Um, nerve blocks, if you have very severe pain, sometimes for our pancreatic cancer patients, we'll do a celiac axis block because uh, the pain can be unrelenting and, and pretty severe. Uh, and of course, pain medications. But my thing is, is that if you can kind of modify or modulate how many opiates you're on, that's good. So sometimes we'll give like NSAIDs, assuming your kidney function's okay and you, you don't have a history of ulcers, is good for inflammatory type of pain. And in that way, uh, you can kind of maybe come down on the opiate dose, whether it be Oxycontin or MS Contin, fentanyl patch. And, and that can be good, because opiates are a good medication, but they, they can have pretty significant side effects too. So bladder and bowel problems, this might be more germane to some patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. Uh, certainly for prostate cancer patients, but we've had patients where it was so bad where they were inhibited to go outside because they thought that they might have an accident and, and what have you. So you know, one thing that I found that can sometimes help some patients are Kegel exercises where you kind of strengthen the pelvic girdle, if you will. It can help maintain some, maybe some more measure of control for your bladder or bowel. Um, let the doctor know if you have diarrhea or constipation. Sometimes that can be a harbinger of something else going on, God forbid cancer coming back. But sometimes that can be from long-term side effects of treatment. So that's something that should be addressed. So menopausal symptoms. Um, you know, I, this is platinum and pemetrexid. Uh, if, let's say, you're 48 year old female, uh, we have induced some patients into premature menopause because of chemotherapy drugs. And uh, what I will say that if, if hot flashes, if that were to happen to somebody and it were to be overbearing, we do have medications, Effexor and Clonidine that are very good uh, for that. Uh, emotional feelings, I, I think this is where the survivorship uh, clinic, uh, both at Anne Arundel and all over the country, uh, can be very good because, in my opinion, uh, I think this is one aspect that we don't address uh, with as much uh, rigor as we could or should, perhaps. 
Um, but I think surviving cancer, it can really affect everything about you, psychosocially, how you process the world, and, and everything. And, and uh, one thing that I think uh, has really helped is just be open with family and friends. I, I've had some patients who've kind of uh, hid their feelings from everyone, didn't let them know how they felt, and, and I don't think that's good, necessarily. Uh, so uh, the, as a caregiver, when, when patients have fears um, that how do we know the cancer's not coming back, I think we have to respect that because it's very hard to imagine what a patient's going through. It's, very, it's a very difficult time, and I, I think we have to be sympathetic to that. So I think as a, as a patient, you should bring those up to your caregiver. Uh, and follow your heart. Everyone's built differently. I, I've had many patients where uh, after going through this treatment, uh, they felt that they could take on the world. They felt very emboldened. We've also had patients who felt very battered after treatment and they needed help, uh, you know, whether it was from their loved ones, whether it's from caregivers, psychiatrists, psychologists. So all I'm saying is that everyone's different, so follow your heart. Uh, you know, some, sometimes people like to see counselors, some patients do not. Uh, some patients you know, feel most comfortable talking to the primary care doctor, maybe some to the medical oncologist, but I would just bring it up to someone. So uh, I will say that um, the, the one thing I want to focus on this slide, if I could please, is that you know, what st studies have shown that the more well-informed you are about your illness, the less scary it is. So I think it's really great that they have this symposium for mesothelioma. I think it's wonderful everyone's here learning about all the science. Uh, I kind of miss some of the science because when I was at MD Anderson, we used to learn about this stuff all the time. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of brilliant scientists out there who provide hope with new discoveries. And so I think that the more well-informed, uh, the more well-versed you are about the disease, instead of becoming more scary, in some ways it can become less scary. Now, there are very scary numbers out there for prognosis that are published, but by golly, uh, I think there's a lot of promise with different studies underway, some at Sloan Kettering, some at Minnesota that we heard about. So depression and feeling alone, again, very common. And I, I will say that there's different ways to go about this, but the most important is, is please just be open and honest. Uh, it, it, you may not have this. this. I'm not saying everyone has this, please, but I, I think that a lot of people do. And it's been published that the majority of cancer patients have a component of this. Uh, and I would say bring it to someone's attention. And if they uh, don't provide the, uh, the ear that they should, then seek someone who will, whether it's a counselor or somebody. Just be your own advocate when it comes to this. So I have, I've got, uh, I was trying to make a top 10, but I think it's a top 11 list. I was trying to be like David Letterman. Uh, but some survivorship advice altogether, emotional well-being. I'm a big fan of you know, support groups, becoming a cancer advocate, turning a negative into a positive. Uh, number two is physical well-being. Big fan of exercise. It doesn't have to be anything major league, but just by walking, gardening, you know, doing the things that you enjoy doing even before the cancer diagnosis. Um, if you do happen to have a history of smoking and heavy drinking, you know, please try to curtail that. So eat healthy, what does that mean? Well, like we talked about, two or three servings each of fruits and vegetables. I think increasing fiber to keep your stool regular is good. Uh, for reducing stress, and that can be through many different ways. You know, we have yoga, different hobbies, spiritual, uh, deep breathing. Anything that you can provide, finds, you find comfort in, you should do that. Uh, health screenings, you know, a lot of our patients, even who are four or five years from cancer, you know, one thing we try to remind them is that, hey, you, you know, you're back to baseline, you know, so uh, we do recommend that they get their vaccinations, colonoscopies, you know, things that they would otherwise. Uh, being a cancer survivor, um, it's pretty special, you know, and, and I think that Everyone, it's never too late to change, and, and we've, I've been really amazed and humbled. We've had a lot of cancer survivors and different types of tumors who may have had some maladaptive type behavior patterns, maybe, I'm just saying smoking or things of that nature, and they quit, and, and I think that's really cool. Uh, it's never too late to make a turn for the better for, for all of us. Uh, be, number seven, becoming an advocate for other patients, like a lot of you are doing here, I think is awesome. Again, turning a negative into a positive. Uh, we've had patients do a lot of fundraising, cancer research, which is awesome. I think lung cancer and mesothelioma are underfunded, if you look at it. I mean, look, look at breast cancer and colon cancer, and I'm glad they are. Th th those are important diseases. But I think lung cancer is really underfunded. 
not just mesothelioma, but small cell, non-small cell. And a lot of people say that it was, it's your fault because you smoke, and it's not true. I, I think there should be more funding, and, and I think that a lot of patients have really, um, they really have been the forebearers for really increasing that, and I think that's really neat. Uh, join a support group. I think that anything you, you, in, in cancer, uh, it sometimes strength in numbers. Uh, when you have had know of people who've gone through the same treatments, uh, through the same scary numbers, um, it can be pretty empowering, and you can find lifelong friends. Um, I would say that couple counseling, you know, after treatment, a lot of our patients maybe don't feel as intimate, you know, and th that's an issue for quality of life, and so we have, we send a lot of our patients to uh, sexual counseling, or sometimes a gynecologist will have different lubrication for physical things that may be an issue. Uh, and I think it's something that is being more published, and it should be. You know, it's important for a lot of patients. So, uh, number ten, oncology social workers. Uh, I think they do an amazing job. Our nurse practitioners and uh, social workers at Anne Arundel and and at MD Anderson and, and Johns Hopkins, uh, before that, they do an amazing job. And and as a medical oncologist, I I can't we can't do our job without them. They're 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 pretty huge, and so and oftentimes they'll talk about things uh, like financial issues. Um, things of that nature, and it really takes a team in oncology, not just radiation oncologists, surgeons, and medical oncologists, pathologists, but social workers, nurse practitioners are, are hugely important, and so um, I really appreciate what they do. And the, the last thing, number 11, uh, survivorship programs. Uh, we have one in breast cancer. We hope to expand it to different tumor subtypes. I think uh, MD Anderson and a lot of other places have them now, and I think they're a really cool opportunity. So this is a survivorship clinic at Anne Arundel. This is only one slide about it. It just, it's a nurse practitioner run. Uh, I helped out a little bit with some of the medical nuances, if you will, but all the credit goes to them. And it just talks about, they, they give you like a treatment plan, like a summary like we talked about. They talk about when you should get CAT scans, how often, who should be ordering it. Uh, they send it out to all the oncologists, uh, radiation, medical, so everyone's on the same page. And they talk about things like sexual issues, genetic counseling, physical therapy for lymphedema, maybe not so much for mesothelioma, but for breast cancer, we see that a lot. Uh, so I think it's a really neat program. Oh, and, and also there was a six week uh, where like once a week, the survivors would get together and talk about their experiences, which I thought was pretty, pretty neat. So this is my, my group, and I, I wanna thank Photoshop because Dr. Watkins right next to me has got a foot on me in height and they cropped it, so I'm almost seeing eye to eye with him. So thank, thank you for uh, having me. So, yeah, any, go ahead. I'm in my late 70s, and when I grew up, cancer was never mentioned. It was taboo, and I know people still treat it that way. My dealing with two cancers was to tell everybody whether they liked it or not, and for this last session with mesothelioma, my wife had an email run to about 30 or 40 people who at one time expressed some interest, and the response was wonderful. I got wow. help, I got enthusiasm, and I got it off my chest by sharing it. Now, some people don't like to look at my scars or do this, but nevertheless, it's a wonderful therapy when you can share it with lots of people and they're willing to accept it. So uh, uh, don't hide cancer because everybody's got it and that's what you find out. What? You, somebody, every time you talk to somebody about your cancer, oh, I've yeah, got right, it here. Right. So it's wonderful. Thank I you. agree with you. Well, I, I, and I think your comment's exactly right. I think, yeah, so, yeah, congratulations to you. That's awesome. And, and I think you're right. I think the stigma of cancer, uh, we used to call it the C word in residency, uh, has, it's being promulgated more and more. We're more comfortable with that term. And, and I think that's great that you, you did that. And, and uh, cancer's become, more and more people are surviving it now. We've made great advances, over 70%. It, this is not a death sentence. Uh, we've made many strides and we'll continue to do so. 
Go ahead, sir. Hi. So one of the things that I think you may, it may have been uh, like a sub-bullet of depression is the guilt of survivorship. And I don't think, uh, and, and as you go further out into your survivorship and you lose, we're a very tight community. Oh, yeah. And when we lose mm -hmm. somebody, the guilt of them going and us still being here really weighs on us. I just wonder if you even cover that in, in your program, you know, your well, studies. Well, I, I think it's, uh, you, you bring up a great point. And I thought about actually having a slide on, on that. Um, we've, one of the emails I, I had, I think it was with Mary, uh, we, we talked about some of those thematic concepts, and, and you're exactly right. I, I will say that, I, I, first off, I, I can only imagine uh, you know, what that individual must be feeling, so I, I don't mean to lecture anyone on this. And, but I, I think that by virtue that you're here uh, is awesome, because it's like there's always there's a beacon of hope, uh, you can be an advocate, which you certainly are, obviously, and you know it's one of those things where being having guilt of survivorship. I think of it as really a blessing in many ways, and, and I think that I, I would just use it to the utmost extent to really be an advocate, which everyone you know here is. And so, in terms of having those feelings, I can understand you know why, uh, especially for mesothelioma, where We've had so few patients really survive that five-year benchmark that's been published, but I, I think that by by morphing that guilt-type feelings into just being an advocate is really the best way to go. I really do. But that the feeling that you endorse having is really of the few patients I had the good fortune to treat as a fellow, and we've seen one or two at Anne Arundel with mesothelioma. Um, they've all had intimated the same type of feelings you just did. Thank you. I think, thank you. And was there any other questions, please? Um, I know you touched on um, supplements, and you even use them, you know, incorporate them into your own life. I talk to a lot of patients who um, are recommended supplements by a nutritionist or a cancer nutritionist specifically, but there are some patients I work with who don't have access to a nutritionist, um, and. They lend them, the internet lends itself to these kinds of things, but I was wondering if either you knew some really good resources that were available to everyone about that, or if it really, they should work with a professional nutritionist on that. Well, that's a fair question. I will say that there could be a resource for nutrition out there that I'm not aware of. Um, in fact, you know what? I think there is a, I don't have the web address. There is a source, I'm not sure by whom, uh, but it's somewhat accredited, if I'm not mistaken, and perhaps I can email it to Mary or, or someone. Uh, but personally, I, I don't know. I mean, I think supplements are great in some ways, but I, I think the, the ones that I get most concerned about are if someone says a supplement to reduce the risk of cancer coming back. Because I'm not saying that can't happen, because a lot of the chemotherapy drugs we have are from the bark of trees. If you go to the Botany Museum in the Smithsonian, not too far away from here, you'll see chemotherapy plants, uh, including one for arenotecan and what have you. So those are the supplements that I get a little bit wary of, uh, if you will. So personally, I would still make sure the caregiver team's aware of it. Because if for nothing else, um, it, it would be good for them to chronicle going forward, maybe an observation that, hey, we've had three out of three patients who've done well, all amazing, and they've all taken a supplement. So I think it will be good to include the caregiver in some capacity. I have a question from the live stream. Oh, sure. So would it benefit a long-term survivor who's six and a half years to have a history of their treatment, chemo given, details of surgery, sent to their care doctor who handles the chronic pain control? You know, I, I, think, I, I think it would be important still. I, I really do. I, that's um, amazing, six and a half years after treatment. Um, I think it would still be important, and, and the reason being is, is that I, I can't speak for the type of pain this individual may be dealing with right now, uh, but long-term neuropathy, as an example, is a major league deal, and that's from cis, cisplatin's well chronicled. It's an alkylating drug that can cause it. There's new studies, one that was recently published with Cymbalta, that can really help with neuropathic pain. So that would be important, perhaps, for the primary person to know that if they were exposed to that chemotherapy drug, hypothetically, 
that by giving another drug that's recently being studied for neuropathy, their pain might get better. Um, so I, I still think it would be helpful. I really do. Any other questions, please? No, right. So I, did you have a question? Oh, okay, go ahead, please, I'm sorry. My question is regarding the quality of life issue. And when you're at, whether it be in a trial and there's a lot of side effects, or whether it just be in your day-to-day -day living as you're progressing through the disease, mm -hmm. who is the best um, advocate for you or the best doctor or psychologist or whatever to help work with you, maybe it's your priest, I don't know, to help work with you on where those you know, limits are for you. And for every person it's going to be different. But what do you do? I mean, at some point survivorship may become, you know, as you're towards death. And yeah. how do you best deal with that? Well, um, I think it's a great question. And my visceral response to that, I don't think there's a wrong, right or wrong answer. My visceral response would be who you're most comfortable with. And, and, I, and the reason why I say that is, if let's say hypothetically I would say your medical oncologist is your quarterback, if I can use that term, that medical oncologist may or may not lend his or her ear to what symptoms you're going through. And so you might feel that he's not, he or she's not listening to me. And in that circumstance, perhaps there is a priest, perhaps there is a counselor that you have a long-term relationship with who will be open uh, to that. So my visceral response to your question would be whoever you're most comfortable with. I, I do, I, I, at least in our hospital, um, it's just for breast cancer, but again, I think the nurse practitioners are pretty amazing. And, and the reason, first off, I really respect what they do. But I think on top of it, you know, oftentimes as a medical oncologist, if I could, I'm so focused sometimes on going over the CAT scan results, if you will, and neuropathy. You know, sometimes this is my fault from giving the chemo and this is a medication we can help you. That in a 15 or 20 minute visit, it, it can be somewhat challenging to really address some of the other concerns that are very legitimate. You know, let's say hopelessness, I'm just saying. So I think nurse practitioners are, are really critically important. I, I, think, I think we're gonna see more and more of them uh, at MD Anderson, we had so many of them, you know. But I, I would say whoever you're most comfortable with. The only corollary or caveat to that statement is that let's say there is something more medical going on, then you need to have a physician involved to some degree. So one of your, part of your question, I think, which is very good, it becomes very blurred what's medical and what's kind of, what's, it's kind of a gray area to some degree. So I would take a two-pronged approach. I would go to a a person, even let's say, quote unquote, a non-medical professional uh, for a lot of the, the concerns, spiritually or emotionally, what have you. Uh, but I, I would bring it up to any member of your caregiver team, whether it be the surgeon, radiation doctor, medical oncologist that you feel most comfortable with and perhaps might be receptive to your questions. And, and it could be a medical issue that's lurking beneath. You know, So I, I would use a two-pronged attack for something like that. But there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. Right. Any other questions? Right. Well, thank you so much, and best wishes.